Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your phones off. Then, if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker after her presentation. I have great pleasure of uh, welcoming Professor Jack Perth and welcoming uh, Ricky Chan. Professor Jack Perth is one of the top accounting resource leaders in the world. She is currently head of accounting and finance at the University of Western Australia and the currently chair of the chairs of accounting and finance forum. Jack is a military uh, Australian past president of the, uh, the accounting and the finance association of Australian and New Zealand. Uh, she has published in areas such as uh, segment reporting, voluntary disclosure and value relevance. In accounting education, she has published in areas such as XBRL, ICT, use in accounting, data analytical, uh, international student uh, learning. She has been published uh, into ranking journals, uh, including a review of accounting studies, a journal of uh, business uh, ethics, uh, so sport management review, Australian journal of management, accounting and finance, uh, accounting journal of uh, accounting research journal, Australian accounting review, accounting in Europe, journal of emerging technology in accounting journal uh, of uh, accounting education. Now we will start our seminar with Professor Jack. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Hopefully everyone can hear me and see me okay. Uh, greetings from Perth, WA, where the time is now just past 9 p.m. Um, so I'm still um, feeling pretty much awake, um, but I have to do a special shout out to one of my co-authors, Philip, Philip Sinodry, who is there, and he's got the lovely backdrop there of WA Flowers, but he's actually in Sydney and it's after midnight. So that's an enormous effort. So um, thank you, Philip, for your support. It's also Welcome. so great. Thank you, Philip. It's also so great to see um, some other familiar names in the audience. And um, we've got a couple of our PhD students. One of them is Jimin. And also I noticed Hadrian from ECU is there. So welcome. It's great to see you. And a whole lot of other colleagues that I know and friends and um, Lindy Bain, um, who is the co-supervisor on this project, is also joining us tonight. So thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, the other really important person um, is Ricky, who was introduced at the start. So this is from Ricky's PhD, and um, both Lindy and I, as I said, are supervising Ricky. So we'll hear a bit from Ricky um, later on. But I just wanted to start off and show you um, now. Is that is that moving? Is that moving, Mohammed, or not? No. So it was before, as we know. This is what happens with technology. It's fantastic. Let me just get the slider up. And maybe what I might do. Ah, is that moving now? Yes. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, I thought I'd just start off and show you our beautiful business school building in WA in Perth. So this is where um, we work from. And um, currently though, I'm actually working at home tonight, um, but the, my backdrop is um, our main graduation hall called Winthrop Hall. And that's what you see behind me. Um, but the building in front of you on the slide is our business school building. So for those of you who haven't been there, some of you work there, some of you study there, some of you visit there, but some of you probably have never been to Perth, um, you are most welcome. So hopefully when the borders open, we will get you to visit us at WA. This is a picture of the river across the road from our building. So you just walk out the door from the business school and this is what you see. So it is quite beautiful. And um, I've been down there tonight at the water before I did this presentation and um, it was very flat, like you can see, lots of boats, so a very nice place. So I am very lucky that I work in such a lovely part of the world. So 
Um, Muhammad did a fabulous job of introducing me. Thank you, Muhammad. Um, so just a few things I just want to highlight before we get going and um, just to sort of explain a bit of background and where I'm coming from, where we're coming from with this paper. So um, prior to UWA, I was at the University of Queensland, uh, Monash University, the Australian National University where I did my PhD, and the University of Melbourne. So um, you've probably heard of some of those institutions. Um, over the years, I have taught both financial accounting, accounting information systems um, at different levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, MBA. Um, in recent years, I've been getting more into business analytics. So a lot of us are doing a lot more in that area. So we're currently developing lots of courses, masters and bachelor in that space. So I've been very heavily involved in that. Um, so up until July or August, I was the president of AFANS um, and I was on the board for 10 years, a long, long time. Some of you may have heard of AFANS before. Um, AFANS is the largest accounting and finance association in Australia and New Zealand. And the reason I'm just mentioning it here is because we offer many free online seminars, much like this seminar tonight. Uh, AFANS does them every month. So that might be something you might want to have a look at if you're enjoying these seminars. There's other online seminars. They also have an annual conference. And if you are a PhD student, you can join for $20. Um, so it's a really reasonable price. That's 20 Australian dollars. Um, I have been on a few journals in terms of editorial roles. Um, at the moment, um, I'm just doing a number of different advisory um, roles on editorial boards and things like that. Um, and in terms of supervising, um, Obviously, Ricky here tonight is one of my PhD students, um, but I have other students looking at topics such as management earning forecasts, integrated reporting, uh, technology and the accounting profession, and also another technology themed PhD adapting learning resources in accounting. So, um, quite a diverse range of students. Um, and then my research is equally as diverse and that's in areas such as cryptocurrency, um, professional skepticism. I've got a project on insurance contracts. Um, we've also got, also got projects on digital adaptability by accountants. And my project with Philip is on corporate governance in Malaysia by Malaysian business. So um, there's a number of different projects, lots of different interests. And I might have mentioned, I actually did one of these seminars last May in 2020, and uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, but I did point out that my research does tend to be um, um, varied, uh, diverse, and I think that just keeps me very happy and positive and energetic about my research. Um, I would say I'm never really an expert in any area uh, because I do like diversity, but um, the diverse research helps me a lot with my supervision um, because I do supervise a lot of students from different backgrounds, different uh, research topics, and honours as well. So that works really well for me. So that's enough about me. I'm now going to let Ricky introduce himself um, and also just talk a little bit about the background behind this paper, um, which is part of his PhD. So he's going to just mention briefly his PhD project and how this fits in. So, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jack for introducing me. Uh, I'm Ricky, um, a PhD student from uh, Utah Bay. Um, I'm working with Jack and Lindy. Um, currently, I'm completing my thesis and uh, will submit um, in the near future. And uh, my thesis contains uh, three projects. So next slide, please, Jack. 
So um, my thesis has three projects covering the evolution of uh, ESG reporting development in Hong Kong. So um, the first project is about uh, lobbying activity of stakeholders on mandating uh, ESG reporting uh, during the 215 consultation period in Hong Kong. I use um, Leslie Mansa to analyze the open-end responses and also Chi-Square to analyze the uh, closed-end responses. So um, next slide, please. And for the second project, I investigate the determinant of uh, ESG disclosure um, under the voluntary and also mandatory period. So uh, I'm using both uh, database and hand collect data to analyze uh, the determinants. So, um, and uh, the study uh, we are presenting today is the final project. And we examine the value relevance of environmental and social uh, disclosure. So uh, it's a bit about my background. So I hand over to you, Jeff. Thanks, Ricky. Um, so as you can see, this um, essay, this piece, this paper fits into the entire study looking at ESG reporting in Hong Kong. So what we're going to do today is present this paper on value relevance of ESG reporting, actually ENS, so environmental and social reporting in Hong Kong. Um, so we're going to just provide a pretty standard presentation. So we're going to give a summary of the study um, and talk briefly about the findings. Um, then we're going to give a background on ESG reporting. I noticed there's another ESG presentation, I think next week in this series, and there's other ESG presentations going on. So um, we won't spend too long on the background, but we'll give a little bit of background and the momentum that's been gaining in the last few years. Um, and then I'm gonna hand to Ricky to give a background on Hong Kong. Uh, he is from Hong Kong and an expert on Hong Kong. So um, I'm gonna hand to the expert. Then we're gonna just take you through a very brief literature review in the area that we're talking about, how we motivate the hypothesis of this paper, um, and then introduce you to the research methodology and talk about the results. Um, we're gonna talk all about the robustness testing. In this paper, we've done a lot of robustness testing. Um, so it will be really good to hear your insights. If you've got any further ideas, that will be really um, grateful, we'll be very grateful. And um, talk about the conclusions future research and some research limitations. So as I said, pretty standard um, presentation tonight, but um, as I said, this is a um, the final paper and um, we're very happy to be giving it its first presentation tonight. So um, it's quite fitting and okay. also um, we're very happy to get um, feedback on this paper, okay? So um, Ricky and Lindy are both there. They're gonna be taking notes if we've got any questions. All right, so let's get started. So um, what we're doing as the title tells us and as Ricky has already mentioned, uh, we are looking at the association between environmental and social disclosures and firm valuation. So when we talk about that, we're really specifically looking at share price um, for Hong Kong companies under a mandatory reporting regime in Hong Kong. Now, as you will learn, um, Hong Kong is a really a new, unique country to study here because of recent changes to requirements for ESG reporting. Now, we know this is an area, and this is one thing that we've really had to factor into this study. We know this is an area which is very, very much a well-researched area at the moment. Uh, a lot of researchers, a lot of PhD students are looking at sustainability reporting. 
Um, so we know that there's studies going on in integrated reporting, ESG reporting, um, sustainability reporting in general, carbon emissions, all of these topics, there's a lot of work going on. Um, so it was very important for us, for Ricky, to find his own area in Hong Kong um, and find his contribution to the um, body of work out there. Um, the other thing is, is that we know that there's a lot going on and I draw your attention to the consultation paper, the recent consultation paper on sustainability reporting um, by the IFRS Foundation. And, um, you know, in, in that, I mean, obviously it sets out some of the issues involving sustainability reporting and, um, and also looking at having um, an oversight body for standard setting in this area. So obviously it is a topic that is gaining in importance. It has been for a while, but we know that what's happening here with the IFRS Foundation is something also that is providing motivation for future work in this space as well. Now, I mentioned Hong Kong being unique um, and it's just a really nice um, setting um, because ESG disclosure requirements became mandatory from 2016. Um, so we are capitalising on that in this study by looking at the value relevance in a mandated time period. Um, other parts of Ricky's work also look at the voluntary period. So we look at 2011 and 2014. So that was voluntary time period. So it's really nice that we can capture both voluntary disclosures and mandatory disclosures within this thesis. So we see that as being another important contribution. Um, Ricky will talk about the Hong Kong situation in relation to this comply or explain basis. So that was something else that was occurring in Hong Kong um, before the actual mandated requirements that we're seeing at the moment. So that's something else. Um, now, one of the other really important aspects of this study is the hand collected disclosure index. So a lot of studies in this space, a lot of the extant uh, literature, they what they do is they use databases, um, so asset four, to get the data on the ESG reporting. We have used that data elsewhere, but in this particular paper, in this particular paper, we are doing a hand collect disclosure index, which Ricky spent a long time, and he's going to tell you all about that, a very long time collecting the data for. But in addition, in robustness testing, we also use the database. So we do a comparison with the results from the hand collect and the database, and we find that there is a difference between those two sources. So what do we find? What are our main findings here? We find that the composite ESG data, and really, I have to be careful because I keep saying ESG, it's actually ENS. So the composite environmental and social data is value relevant. So that means that when we enter the variable showing environmental and social data together in the Olson model, in the share price model, we find that is value relevant. We find our disaggregated subscore. So when we break down the subscore into social, we find that data is value relevant. But when we break down, disaggregate the environmental score itself, we find that is not value relevant. Okay, so when we talk about how these scores are how these scores are calculated, what is in the index, that will provide you with some insights 
into why this may or may not be value relevant. So I think the actual composition of those indexes actually, or the sub-index actually uh, explains the results. So we'll talk about that as well. All right, so I'm probably preaching pretty much here to the converted and to people who have a bit of knowledge and Philip's nodding his head, thank you. Um, so I know there's a lot of people here who do research in this space. Um, so um, obviously there's a great background um, recently uh, in terms of the terminology ESG, first proposed by the United Nations in June 2004. And Hong Kong adopted the term ESG, but we also know where it gets a bit confusing is that we have interchangeable terms for ESG reporting. So, um, you know, and we have to be careful because the terms can mean the same, but then the composition of what goes into these terms can be different. So it's always really important in this space to clearly define what you mean. So that's why tonight with our ESG, I can tell you we're really talking about environmental and social, not the governance aspect of that composition. So other terms which come up when you start doing literature reviews in this space include CSR as well, uh, corporate responsibility, non-financial reporting, triple bottom line, okay, lots of different terms, um, which are sort of, they're different, but they're under this umbrella of what we're seeing in this area. Okay, so um, this is just a recent report, uh, KPMG, uh, is that correct, Ricky, KPMG? Yeah, so this is the KPMG 2020 um, figures on global ESG reporting rates. And um, so what can we see there? You can see that the top line, as I've got in the slide, is representing the largest 250 firms globally. Um, and you can see the rates are now as high as 96% of those largest 250 firms in the world are reporting ESG. Now, for an earlier presentation, we showed another slide from two years ago, 2018, and the figure has markedly increased. So we're, we're seeing this nice upward trend um, with um, take on rates, which is really, really good. Um, the bottom line, the 80% is the largest top 100 from each country all merged together. So that's 80% are reporting ESG. Okay, so just a little bit of background there. Um, now switching to the ESG reporting rates by region. So you can see um, top there, we've got the Americas 90%, 70% um, in Europe, 59% in the Middle East and Africa, and 84% in Asia Pacific. Now I should add that in the 59%, We've also actually got South Africa, which is 96%. Now, South Africa, of course, for those of you who study in this area, follow the research, know that there is mandatory integrated reporting in that country. So that explains the high rate in South Africa. Okay, so um, in terms of ESG reporting required as listing rules in respective countries, so we can go through and have a look at the different countries here. So we've got countries such as Belgium, Brazil, Hong Kong obviously is included there, France, India, 
Indonesia, Ireland, Luxembourg, Malaysia, Namibia, Nigeria, Peru, Philippines, Portugal, Seychelles, Singapore, South Africa, Thailand, Netherlands, etc. So you can see the countries where it's a requirement as a listing rule. So again, this helps explain some of those continent figures that we just had a look at before. Now, this particular table, which is in the paper, um, talks about specific country requirements um, in addition to listing rules and ESG. So you can see the timeline that we've got here, um, talking about developments and what's happening in the US, uh, in the UK. And the nice thing here um, about this is that, as you can see, there's different requirements, different um, um, items that are specified in the different countries. So in the SEC, we're seeing information about environmental matters um, just in general. Then you can see more specific in the UK, disclosures about greenhouse gases, human rights, gender diversity, information in the EU, uh, policies, risks and results of certain ESG matters. And then we've got China jointly issued the social responsibility guidelines. Australia, we've got companies disclosing any material exposure to economic, environmental and social sustainability risks. Hong Kong, we had the voluntary period, as we've been talking about, then the mandatory 2015 guide with effect from 1st of January 2016, which explains the mandatory time period that we're tapping into here. Malaysia, Okay, Philip will correct us if we're wrong with this one. So our requirement through a sustainability statement in the annual reports. I might ask Philip, is that correct? Um, to my knowledge, yes. Can, oh, firstly, can everybody uh, hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Now you're mute. Is this better? Yes. To my knowledge, um, yes, what Jack said is correct. However, I'm um, happy to be much more focused on economics-based um, disclosure of, of um, financial information, and I'm happy to listen to something like this from a distance. Right. Okay, good. All right, just checking with the Malaysian expert. Um, and, then of, and then, of course, we've got South Africa um, with the mandatory integrated reporting that I talked about before. Singapore upgraded their voluntary sustainability reporting guide to mandatory. And um, we mentioned Hong Kong as well with further, as you can see in the timeline, further upgrades effective from July 2020. So um, just a little question for you. Um, if I know we've got lots of different representation of some of these countries here tonight, this afternoon online, if you have any updates for us on your respective countries, uh, when we get to question time, if you'd like to ask, um, definitely, um, ask the question, make a comment, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, I'm now gonna hand to Ricky, uh, who is an expert on Hong Kong, who's gonna take us through the development of ESG reporting in Hong Kong. Over to you, Ricky. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit. Uh, this chart shows the timeline for development of ESG reporting in Hong Kong at stock exchange level. So before um, 2011, there was no guidelines for um, Hong Kong ESG reporting. So therefore in December 2011, 
the Hong Kong Stock Exchange published the first consultation paper and introduced the first ESG guide in 20, uh, in 2012. So um, the 2012 guide was only voluntary. So um, three years later in 2015, the Stock Exchange published the second consultation paper and upgrade the 2012 guide to 2015 guide. So the 2015 guide was mandatory and uh, was a part of the listing rules. So um, this company are required to report general disclosure from uh, 2016 and environmental KPI from 2017. And, but uh, social KPI was still voluntary at that time. And in 2019, uh, the Stock Exchange published the third consultation paper and finally uh, launched the 2019 guide. Uh, one of the decision was to mandate social KPI effective from 2020. So this study is based on um, the 2019 guide. So uh, next slide, please. So, um, so what's the motivation of using Hong Kong evidence uh, in this study? So on, on one hand, uh, Hong Kong is the international financial center. For example, according to a global financial center index, Hong Kong uh, ranked number three, just behind New York and London. And uh, Hong Kong has the sixth largest stock market and fourth largest foreign exchange market in the world. But on the other hand, um, there's scanned literature on mandatory ESG voting uh, for um, Hong Kong firms. So um, this study aimed to uh, fill this uh, research gap. So, um, so I hand over to you, Jack. Thanks, Ricky. Hopefully everyone can hear me again. All right, so that just gives you a bit of background on why we chose Hong Kong um, and um, a little bit more motivation um, context to the study. So now I'm just going to take you through some of the relevant literature that we talk about in this paper. Um, so we're really drawing on um, literature from um, basically disclosure theory um, to have a look at why people disclose, because obviously here we've got different levels of disclosure. So even though we've got mandatory requirements, um, there are going to be different levels of the ENS disclosure, which we're going to show you when you, we show you the descriptive statistics um, that we've calculated from Ricky's hand collecting of the data. Um, so we're focusing really on um, ESG disclosure um, studies um, and firm value. So um, the paper by Zhu Zhu and Yu, 2019, um, looked at the impact of mandated disclosure on ESG practices in China. So obviously that is a good paper for us um, to refer to here. And in that paper, they introduced government regulatory theory. Um, and really what this is talking about in this paper is how government regulation enacts the integration, maintenance and distribution of public interests. And it has the effect of resulting in more stakeholders monitoring ESG behaviour and an increase in ESG behaviour once it is mandated. So that's one of the papers um, that is related to our study, um, not just the mandated disclosure, but also the fact that it is in a neighbouring country, which is China. Um, also, obviously, there are many papers out there which discuss disclosure theory. And in these papers, um, we can see that there is an expectation that firms disclosing ESG information are valued higher. Um, and that's because if we think about the information that is disclosed, um, there is going to be information about potential environmental, social risk information, 
which really does help various users make decisions about the companies. And the one, the, one of the examples, of course, comes to mind are the banks, the banks using this information to help determine whether or not that company is a risky investment. Um, so, um, you know, that's another reason um, to actually have a look at um, and, and explain and, and link back to um, that theory. We've also, of course, got legitimacy theory. Legitim legitimacy theory is used commonly in a lot of CSR, sustainability, environmental type studies. And in legitimacy theory, we're looking obviously at corporate voluntary information, providing information that legitimizes firm behavior, resulting in a higher firm value. Um, so all of these studies in a way provide a little bit of background to where we're heading with our research hypothesis. In terms of um, financial performance, firm performance and also firm value, um, so there has been some studies, um, but not a lot looking at the impact of mandated ESG. And obviously the reason why there's not a lot of studies out there is because a lot of these mandated requirements have recently come into effect. So we've um, got a few studies I've already mentioned and Chen, Hun and Wang and Ines and Sarah Fame are also um, examples of studies looking at the effect of mandated ESG disclosures on firms' financial performance. We've also got Lawrence Thomas and you, uh, another recent study. And that's the nice thing also about these papers. They are re all going to be very recent. Um, and it's always nice to look at recent studies and look at the techniques they've used, not only the techniques, but the databases. That always gives you extra insights, the variables. So um, there are advantages with that. So this paper examines the relationship between sustainability reporting based on a self-generating score and, and market value of companies listed in Singapore. So they find um, the sustainability reporting has a positive relationship with a firm's market value. And then we've got Lo and Kwan, another recent study examining the effect of ESG and sustainability initiatives on share value. Um, and basically they're looking at cars of 17 firms in Hong Kong. Um, and they show that the market responded more positively to the announcement of ESG than sustainability initiatives. So they're looking, doing a comparison of the two. All right, so this leads us basically to our main question, which obviously we've hypothesized here, and that is um, that there is a positive association between a firm's share price and its ESG disclosures under a mandatory reporting regime. So the mandatory reporting regime obviously um, is post the 2016 uh, mandated requirement in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, just based on the literature that I just talked about, uh, we, you know, we really are testing here that there is this positive association uh, with, a firm, with firm value, which we're looking at in terms of a firm's share price. Okay, so now I'm going to hand to Ricky, who's going to give you background on the data and his construction of the all important to this study, the disclosure index. Ricky. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, first, regarding the sample, uh, I analyzed annual report and uh, sustainability report of the biggest firms listed on Hansen large cap index. Uh, as of uh, 2019, uh, the large cap index has one, 112 firms. Uh, after excluding two delist firms and one newly list firm, the final sample size is um, 109. So in the first part of this study, I hand collect the data and uh, manually construct the index. 
And in the second part, I use regression model to, um, to investigate the relation between uh, ESC disclosure and uh, share price. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, an integral part of this study is the hand collect index. So um, first I download all 109 annual report and 71 sustainability report for the year of uh, 2019. And I compile a list of keywords uh, based on the 2019 guide. And I conduct keyword search to capture the relevant information from the reports. And um, in terms of scoring, I, I give um, zero for long disclosure and one for brief disclosure and two for detailed uh, disclosure. So uh, the, for each disclosure item, the maximum score is two. So I add up the scores. So um, the total, um, the total ESG score uh, is 306 and environmental score is 104 and the maximum social score is uh, 202. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is the example of ESG disclosure uh, made by Cafe Pacific. So the 2019 guide has two areas. So under environmental, the first aspect is emission. So I use the keyword emission to extract this information. For example, um, they disclose uh, some compliance information and the annual report and uh, the uh, emission reduction goals on the sustainability report. So uh, next slide, please. So under social area, uh, the first aspect is employment and labor practices. So for example, um, I use keyword like um, employ, labor to extract this information. So uh, they disclose the total workforces on any report and uh, their uh, labor practices on the sustainability report. So uh, in terms of the scores, not showing here. So um, Cafe Pacific got, uh, got 133, 133 out of 306, which is about uh, 43%. So a bit higher than the average of uh, 38%. So this is just an example of Cafe Pacific. So, um, so I hand over to you, Jack. Thanks, Ricky. So um, one thing you might have noticed when you listened to Ricky then talking about the disclosure scores, um, on average, they're quite low, all right, compared to the total. So um, this is interesting, and it's something that we'll look at in future research because Remember, the mand mandated environment is very soon, like it's still new. So I imagine over time, these rates of disclosure will increase, okay? So just bear that in mind. All right, so um, for those of you who joined me back in May 2020, um, I talked about three papers and I had to go back and look at my notes to see what I talked about. But I did talk about three papers relating to value relevance and disclosure. And one of the slides I included back then was this slide here. Um, and when I was preparing the slides for tonight, I thought, hang on a minute, this is useful to what we're talking about tonight because it really does explain what we do in this type of research. Um, and the other nice thing is um, it's really good to be presenting another paper on value relevance. Um, I haven't really, I've had one other paper in between, but um, in terms of value relevance, but I do other stuff. So it is really good to come back to something I was talking about last year with um, this seminar series. So value relevance research, for those of you um, who aren't as um, 
experienced in it, um, is looking at the association between accounting amounts and market value, firm values. Um, so really what it does is it's testing whether accounting amounts explain cross-sectional variation in share prices. So that's what it's looking. It's looking at the explanatory power um, in terms of those changes that are occurring in share price. Uh, so for most part, value, valuation models form the basis for tests in the literature, and these are developed in terms of the level of firm value. So looking at that share price. Um, so examining changes in share prices or returns is an alternative approach. In this study, we use share price, but we could also use um, changes in prices or returns um, also to measure value relevance. And there's other techniques that are also used in the literature. And obviously, these are some things that we're thinking about for further robust testing and for future research as well. So our three regressions that we're running, and um, the great thing about this type of research, I like it because the models are very simple and they are known as parsimonious models. And you can see there the three main ones that we're work that we're using, as I said, are price models with share prices a dependent variable. Notice we look at share price three months after reporting date. And most of the studies in this area do the same thing to allow for the time lag of the annual report distribution. Um, you can see also that our independent variables, are the core model is book value of equity. So the BV plus earnings per share. And in our first model, we look at the composite calculation of ESG or ES. So that's the aggregate variable. Uh, plus we have controls for leverage and audit. Um, in our second model, we actually test the environmental variable separately. So this is where we have a look at just the environmental disclosure scores. And in the third model, we take out the social environmental scores and have a look at them. So they are the three basic models we're using. In addition, uh, we have lots of different robustness tests uh, where we split up the um, main variable into qualitative and quantitative. So we follow other studies that have done similar things with other types of disclosure although we haven't actually seen it in ESG disclosure. So if anyone has a paper that has done it in ESG, please let us know because we can add that to the list as well. So Ricky already mentioned our Hong Kong sample. Um, this table is just telling you how we come up with the 109. So we really only lost three, lost three firms there. Um, and you can see our financial year ends predominantly, it is the calendar year, 31st of December, 2019. And we've got six at the end of March and four at the end of the financial year, 30th of June. So our descriptive statistics for our 109 firms. Um, so you can see, uh, quite a huge variation there in our share price, which you would expect, but also remember these are the um, from the top firms in Hong Kong. Uh, but still, as we know, there's always going to be big variation within that top level. Um, and then you can see our uh, book value of equity, earnings per share, ESG. Now, the interesting thing here, you can see that the maximum percentage of the index is 63.1%. The minimum is 38.3%. Um, so really what we're seeing here, and this is the point that I highlighted before, where early days of man man mandated requirements, I would expect to see this increasing over the next few years. So when we break down into environmental and social scores, so again, these are scored individually out of 100, 
um, we can see again, basically similar sorts of statistics uh, in terms of averages uh, for both of those. And our leverage, um, you can see um, the, uh, the mean, so um, quite lowly geared and the maximum at 77.9. And surprisingly, um, for those who conduct uh, research in um, Australia, which a lot of us do, we're used to a lot of big four auditors in the top 100. In this sample, uh, big four is only represented by 22 firms and 87 for non-big four. So that's something else which is um, interesting and something to comment on as well. All right, so I think I've just basically um, gone through that um, slide so I can skip over. So let's get to the exciting stuff. We love regressions. Hands up if you like a regression. Well, yes, Philip loves one and I'm sure Ricky loves one and there's others who love them as well. So um, as I said, it's a nice simple model to have a look at that you can see here. And our first regression is just doing the, what we call the basic Olson model here, the basic simplified, I might add, Olson model uh, with EPS and BV, um, both highly significant, which you would expect, um, and explanatory power of 50.1%. Now, for those of you who do value relevance research, that's spot on in terms of what we normally see with explanatory powers. Uh, explanatory power in terms of the adjusted R squared. Um, when we introduce the ESG variable into the model, you can see it's weakly significant um, at the 10% um, level, I think that is, yes, uh, the 0.118. When we introduce our, um, our control variable leverage, um, you can see there, again, weakly significant. Um, and then uh, when we introduce the audit, there is nothing happening there with audit. Um, and the ESG variable keep, re retains its significance. Um, and then the final regression is just introducing all those elements. So pretty um, constant um, adjusted R squares with um, each of those five introductory uh, regressions we've run basically all on that first model. Okay, um, so um, from that, um, the fact that we do have a um, significant variable here, so uh, we basically are, a, you know, we, we do claim to support the, that hypothesis that we talked about, that positive relationship um, with ESG reporting. Um, and this is also consistent with the mainstream literature documenting that non-financial disclosures reduce information asymmetry and hence enhance firm value. So that's what we find. As I said, it's not strongly significant, um, but that you know it is significant there at that le at the ten percent level, but then we come to disaggregating down our ES variable. So what we're doing here is we are introducing subscores for both environmental and for social, and interestingly enough, the environmental is um, not no longer significant, but the social disclosure is significant at the 5% level. So um, we're getting a result with the social disclosures. So that's where we need to start thinking about, well, what's in the social disclosures and what's in the environmental disclosures, which might be driving these results. So, as I said, the coefficient on social disclosures is statistically significant at the 5% level. Environmental disclosure is not significant. And as I said, we need to think about what is contained in the social disclosure. So what's it reporting on? 
and it's reporting on employment, health and safety, development and training, labour standards, supply chain management, product responsibility, anti-corruption, community investment. So all of those things um, are obviously items that users are seeing as being value relevant, that are helping explaining our changes in share prices. Um, our environmental disclosures are talking about obviously carbon emissions, use of scarce resources, environmental resources and climate change. So I think if we think about those two different constructs, uh, one of them is much more positive in nature and the other one has more negative connotation. So to me, that's an interesting result anyway, because I would have thought the negative aspect might still have a significant impact on firm value, on share price. It's not coming out at this stage, but the social disclosure is coming out in a positive way. So a lot more work to be done on that. And as I said, I think when we add on our extra year, so we look at 2020 in time and we look at 2021, I think we're going to see a much, a trend emerge. We can't really talk about a trend at the moment, but we will see a trend emerge. Um, I would say there'd definitely be one in social, but it'd be interesting to see if there's anything happening there with the environmental disclosures. Okay, so what else do we do? So we have done a lot more, or Ricky has done a lot more testing. Um, he's, what we tend to do in value relevant studies is look at alternative dependent variables. And he has looked at share price at balance date. Um, so he's looked at that as an alternative for three months after. Um, and when we run it with that share price, we find that the both coefficients, ESG and the um, social um, variable, the subscore social remain positive significant, but at the 5% level. So actually it's more value relevant and the coefficient of environmental is now significant at the 10%. So we're actually getting better results at the um, share price at balance date. Um, so um, we can conclude that our findings are robust, um, even if they're actually slightly stronger results um, at balance state when we look at that. We haven't actually run the returns model um, pretty sure we haven't done that, Ricky. Um, so that's something else uh, which we could potentially do as well. Obviously, many studies in this area use returns as well. Okay, so now what else do we do? Well, following some other papers, um, a paper by um, another one of my students, uh, Kevin Tai from University of Queensland, um, he did a study on financial instrument disclosure. So again, a hand collect index. And what he did was he looked at the value relevance of financial instrument disclosure and he disaggregated the disclosure into quantitative and qualitative disclosures. So uh, we've followed that same um, model here, if you like. So we know that the ESG disclosures consist of both qualitative and quantitative information. So to give you an example, um, for example, information on emissions has qualitative information in the form of firms emission policies, the types of emissions, description of emission targets, while the quantitative information covers greenhouse gas emissions, total waste produced in tonnes, energy compensation and water consumption, et cetera. So we know we've got a mix of both quantitative and qualitative information there. So the next part of this study, what we do is we separate out the qualitative 
components and the qualitative components. And we really want to see if either of those are value relevant um, and um, which ones are more relevant compared to the other. So um, you can see here, we've got a number of different regressions going on. So the first one is adding in the ESG qualitative. The second one is adding in the quantitative disclosure. The third one is actually taking out a further subscore on emissions. And then also um, we can look at the employment data. So within the index, there's all these different aspects that we can actually focus on or highlight. So that's what we're doing. Um, and then what we also do is we have a look at the ESG score with our database disclosure. So um, as we've been saying, we've hand collected all the data so far, but we decide to use the asset for database figure and um, we enter that into the regression. Um, sorry, that's the Bloomberg one, isn't it? Yeah, the Bloomberg one is the one that we enter in. Um, and then we've also got um, the ESG um, figure in there as well, the weighted, we also look at the equally weighted disclosure index as well. Yeah, it's very small print. Um, I was just struggling to read it. Okay, so um, I think I've cut off a bit of this slide. So hopefully you can sort of see the main results there. So basically in the first regression, the ESG qualitative is um, significant at the 5% level. Uh, we're not getting anything for the quantitative ESG disclosure um, and the emissions, we're not getting anything, which sort of makes sense. Um, it's consistent with our earlier result when we looked at the environmental disclosure, okay? So that was not significant. Uh, employment, um, remember that's part of social, that's again um, significant. And the equally weighted ESG, so it's a reweight of the way we calculated it, is not significant. And the Bloomberg score, which is the asset for score, is not significant. Um, as we said before, basically the adjusted R squareds are all very consistent across those different models. Our leverage, as you can see, for most models is um, significant. Um, and again, we're getting nothing on the audit. Okay, so um, I think basically I've summarised that probably okay. Um, so just that positive coefficient with the qualitative ESG, nothing on the quantitative, um, and um, looking at those other associations, emission and employment, um, where um, getting something on employment but nothing on emission and um, Blueberg asset for score as I said is not significant either so it's just really good to do all these additional tests um, one thing which would be really good to do is to go through um, if we can have a look at um, some of the components of that score um, I think we've actually tried to do that we didn't have any success with that but do a bit of a comparison, try and work out what that score is calculated on to work out where that difference is coming from. That will help explain our results as well. All right, so in addition, we have done even um, some additional testing. Uh, so what we've been talking about tonight is an ES score which is coming out of our annual report and the sustainability reports of these Hong Kong companies. Um, so this is really a combined uh, report score. So of course, we wanna have a look at to see if there's any difference between sustainability reporting, you know, the actual standalone sustainability report and the standalone annual report versus the combined score of sustainability reporting and um, annual report. 
And what we find actually is that when we just look at the single reports, our results, there's nothing significant with that. So the significant variables in terms of sustainability scores or ENS scores come about when we use both reporting mechanisms. So I think that's a really important finding um, that we're looking at both sources of information from both the sustainability and the annual report. And the reason why that's important for this study is because more and more companies, as we know, are now doing these standalone sustainability reports. So I think it's actually adding a bit of value um, to those sustainability reporting that companies are doing. So there is value in actually producing. And we know it's a very expensive report to produce. So, um, so basically, we're, I think we're showing here that um, it's useful to produce um, those two reports. One of them, they have no say in, they have to produce, obviously, the annual report. Um, and then I also just asked Ricky the other day about um, the quantitative and qualitative, uh, to put them both into the same regression and um, that doesn't change anything. So um, the re results uh, remain the same as well. Uh, I'll just quickly ask Ricky. Ricky, was there anything else that you yeah. did? Yep. Yeah, I think that's all. Yeah, you can fire oh, everything. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, just checking. I hadn't forgotten anything. I'm a lot older than you, Ricky. So uh, my memory won't be as good as yours. And plus, you've been running all the tests. Okay, so I'm going to pass to Ricky now, who's going to really just give a good summary and also just talk a little bit about the limitations and where he's going with the future research in this area. Yeah, um, finally, to conclude this study, um, uh, this is the first accounting study to investigate the uh, value relevance of ESG voting. And uh, Using the hand collect data, um, we find a positive association between share price and ESG disclosure. And uh, we'll balance that test uh, show that um, qualitative information is more value relevant than quantitative information. And also social disclosure is more value relevant than environmental disclosure. So uh, this study provides practical implication for regulator, list company, and investor. So uh, in the future, we may extend the data. So may, we may extend the data to uh, 2020 and 2021 to see uh, the, the impact of the 2109, 2019 guide on the uh, disclosure uh, scores and uh, so, uh, because one of the limitation of this study is uh, only using uh, one year data. So, um, so this is our, one of the future uh, plan. So um, that's all for our presentation today. So thank you. Thanks Ricky. And now we are very happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor uh, Jack, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Ricky, for this an excellent presentation. Uh, now, if anyone have any questions, you can ask your question. Open your mic and ask your question. Uh, dear Professor Samir Trabolsi, you have any questions, Professor Samir? Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're calling me. <laughs> thank you, Mohammed. No, no, yeah. thank you. Oh, Hello, Sari. Hi, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, nice, nice to, see to see you. Yeah, nice to see you here. Yeah, hi Ricky, I'm Jack's previous student um, at UQ. So <laughs> yeah, happy to come <laughs> here. So actually I have a question for you because I've been uh, studying about this ESG disclosure as well. So when I was Googling about the Hong Kong standard, I found the new company's ordinance, which mandated UK, sorry, Hong, sorry, Hong Kong companies to disclose uh, environmental and employee related disclosure in director's report from 2014. So I'm just wondering what's the difference between that uh, regulation and the listing rule as you focus on in your study? 
Yeah, uh, so for this study, uh, I focused on uh, stock exchange level. So uh, mm -hmm. when I talk about uh, mandatory reporting, ESG reporting in Hong Kong, so we focus on listing rules. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, listing rules is applicable to all these companies. Mm -hmm. So, um, but uh, when we talk about company audience, uh, it's, uh, it's more about uh, legislative uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. So company audience normally uh, apply to both uh, private company and this company. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, the, so we focus on listing rule uh, in this study. Yeah. But if the audience is also, uh, I mean, if the audience is applicable to both listed and private companies, that means that is also influential for public companies, right? And and actually, I I think the time. In terms of the time, um, both company audience and and listing rule require a Hong Kong company to report on ESG reporting. Uh, in I think in two thousand sixteen. Sixteen. More or less 16. the same. Yeah, I okay. mean the effective date uh, should be two thousand sixteen, and um, so um, so in this study we focus on listing rules, but um. But of course, a uh, company audience is part of the requirement for mm -hmm. for for both uh, list and uh, private companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll, and, I'll have to double check. Uh, yeah, but also um, uh, the ESG reporting guide part of the listing rule is more comprehensive. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, that's the difference uh, between okay. company audience and uh, uh, listing okay. rules. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. I have a, have a double check on that. Thank yeah, thank you. No, and then also for the UK, because I'm currently in the UK actually. Um, so as far as I know, UK actually has a mandated rule to disclose um, environmental and social related information in director's report, effective yeah. from 2006. And then it moved the rule to strategy report from 2013. So actually the rule started in 2006. So you yeah. may want to have a double chat on that as well. Thanks, Serene. We can yeah. update that. Thank yeah. you. And that's exactly why I asked the question, just mm -hmm. to have someone like you who's mm -hmm. in the UK to mm -hmm. give us that really nice recent advice. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. I noticed you've also given us a working paper yep. there mm -hmm. um, from SSRN. I don't mm -hmm. know if we've seen that one, so we can check that. So thank you. I'm yep. just reading the questions in the um, chat. Um, so that's excellent. So thank you for all the questions. Um, there is, oh, goodness me. There is a question there. Um, uh, I was just having a look at there. Uh, do you examine the difference in value relevance between ENS information in the annual report versus the ESL, ESG disclosures or do you group them together? So I think that's the question that we answered at the end of the paper, which we yes. did in the robustness test, where we uh, combine it, that's what we do initially, and then we look at it separately. And there's no there's not, no difference in looking at it separately to looking at it together. Um, Chi Yoon has given us um, a really not a good comment there, which I can I can explain and Ricky can probably explain as well. And he is totally correct um, that the relationship between ESG and financial performance is mixed. I only highlighted one of the studies. There's a lot of other studies in the paper. Um, so um, as you've pointed out, there are papers which find high uncertainty in ESG returns. There's a paper today which read, which found there's a long run positive realized returns. Given these mixed findings and results, how do you come up with a conclusive value relevance of ESG on firm valuation in a general context? So thank you for your um, point. It is a good point. I think basically I didn't um, highlight all the studies, obviously, and there's a lot of other studies, but it's going to be good for us to Sorry. just... could you say that again? Sorry, that's my watch telling me. He thought that I asked him a question. Um, so um, we need to basically have a look at those and um, just think a little bit more about that hypothesis. That's, I think, what we're talking about there. Um, uh, what else have we got there? 
And on today, any issues between ESG disclosure and size? Um, I didn't actually report the um, correlation matrix there. Um, and just thinking about um, those sorts of issues, but obviously ESG and size. And I don't think we controlled for size, did we? Do we look at size? Uh, value if it's a proxy for the size. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, of course, we've got just all large companies. Um, yeah. All large companies because yes. this is the top um, 200 representative or whatever it is. Um, but that's something else to think about, um, Ricky, and to acknowledge um, those issues. Thank you for that. Um, asset four is for ESG performance. Um, Bloomberg is for ESG disclosure score. Yeah, uh, to, to, to uh... So to explain a little bit, uh, we are using Bloomberg, not Asset4, yeah. Right, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I think I had said Asset4. I was yeah. picking that up from another study. It's Bloomberg, yeah. Bloomberg, so thank you yeah. for that point. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that point. Uh, another, gee, there's some great questions. How did you score ESG qualitative? You have chosen some keywords and how you give them codes based on the disclosure in the sustainability report. Okay, Ricky, any quick insight on how you calculated ESG qualitative? No, I just I use the same scale. Uh, I just uh, give a zero for long disclosure and one for brief disclosure and two for detail. So, but for or quantity information, uh, maybe I, if they disclose, I give two. If they not, if they don't disclose, I give zero. Because, uh, uh, yeah. So, um, so maybe there's a bit different between qualitative and quantitative. Yeah. Okay. So again, if you've got any advice on possible additional testing we could do with the qualitative. Uh, we can take that into consideration. That is an extra test we've done. It wasn't part of the original study, but we decided to go down that path. But if you've got another way of measuring it, that would be really good to hear from you. Uh, can you write the reference for this article? Not yet, because <laughs> it's not an article yet, but um, hopefully... Um, Later on next year, uh, it'll um, go to um, a journal. We're hoping for that. After we take into account all of these fabulous comments. So thank you. Um, Sally, is Sally here? Sally has one question, I think. Sally? Yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's really interesting and useful. And uh, my uh, PhD topic is literally about uh, ESG and I was very interested, to be honest. Uh, so I just have um, one question regarding to the results. Um, you know, when you were like uh, examining the, um, the individual pillars of ESG, environmental, social and governance, and the results show that uh, there is a significant relationship between the social pillar and firm value, right? So uh, what do you think, like why, why this result, why social pillar is um, the most significant one when it comes to firm value in Hong Kong? Ricky? Yeah, I think uh, so, so disclosure is more, is more positive. So because including uh, uh, labor practice, Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there's, so I, I, I think environmental, on the other hand, environmental disclosure is more, sounds more negative because it's talking about emission mm -hmm. and uh, so carbon emission. So, um, so that's why I think uh, social disclosure is more positive. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, there was another question um, from Kasara, a really good question, and I don't think we explained it well at all, and that was, um, well, I didn't explain it, and that was, is there any specific reason for excluding governance? 
So I think Ricky has the answer for that. Yeah. Um, first of all, in terms of the terminology, uh, the stock exchange officially adopt ESG, but according to the um, the reporting guide, they only focus on environmental and social. Uh, but they do keep the term because uh, regulation is part of governance. So um, social and uh, environmental disclosure cover uh, law and regulation related to social and environmental. So that's why they keep the term ESG. Yeah. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. Um, now, Rashid from ECU, um, I don't know if that's Edith Cowan. Um, hi, Rashid. Um, but um, it's a very good question, and I'm going to answer this one. Uh, the question is, can you compare the results before and after mandatory rule to see the incremental difference? Now, um, great point and something that Ricky will be doing postdoc work on. Um, for this thesis, with the existing chapters he's already done, this is the third essay, um, and already there was so much time spent on composing that disclosure index that we just saw a single year being enough for this paper. Uh, if we had done the whole thesis on this topic, we would have done before and after voluntary mandatory. But it's definitely something that Ricky will look at when he constructs the index for earlier years postdoctorate. The other point you make is a really good one as well, uh, because there will be some sample companies making voluntary ENS before the rule became mandated. Um, and this is something that we always have a look at with these disclosure type studies. Uh, we look at basically the early adopters. Uh, so we haven't looked at that here. Um, but again, if we do expand out the um, time series, we look at say three years of data, five years, whatever we can get, then it would be really good to look at the early adopters. So if we were to go back to say 2016, we'd get the early adopters there because the rule hadn't come in fully until after 2016, way after that. So I think we can really look at those early adopters. But that will expand out the sample. Um, and at this stage, we haven't had time for that. But down the track, this is great. You're giving uh, Ricky plenty of, um, of work that he needs to do. So thank you, Rashid, for um, that um, point. All right. Um, CN agrees with the qualitative scoring method. Sounds like CDP. So it's really good and scientific. Thank you for that. Um, okay, Kasara, and this is a good point. Is there any specific reason for self-generating ESG? What, is there a major difference between this one and the Bloomberg? So we do use Bloomberg, obviously. Um, and that's something that Ricky can talk about a bit more in the paper um, about the differences in the composition but the reason why we used a self-generating index is because Ricky had earlier feedback on an earlier chapter looking at disclosures about using the Bloomberg and he was advised to do a self-index. So that's why we went down that path of doing his <coughs> own index. Uh, the recording, Sally has asked about the recording. I think Muhammad will fill in the gaps with that one. And I think that's all I've got. And we've got five minutes to go. If any other questions, if, uh, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Thank you, Kasara. She has talked about for addressing endogeneity, you can use GMM models with lagged variables. Thank you for that one as well. Yep. We can do that one too, Ricky. Thank you. Uh, another question there. I like this one. When you construct your self index, do you omit materiality? Now, 
is Inka here just to explain materiality in terms of less significant, more significant, like the concept of materiality or something to do with materiality in the disclosure. That would be good if you could uh, explain what you mean, Ika. Is Ika there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Ika. Yes, uh, I mean materiality in this, uh, uh, what I mean is about uh, how can you wait your score with the uh, maybe for first environmental yeah. disclosure or social disclosure which one for the uh, I'm sorry my English is not better yeah that's right yeah yeah uh, I mean that uh, when you score for each elements mm -hmm. of environment or social elements uh, do you give any materiality matters? Which one is better than the other elements? I mean, or maybe you omit uh, the wait waiting. Yes. Okay. I mean? Yeah. Thank you. So the first part, um, we, we do do the equally weighted robustness test. Um, yeah, yeah. eliminate the really weighted. Yes. Yeah. Is does that answer that bit of the question? Yes, equally yeah. weighted for yeah. each. Yeah. yeah, equal weighted. Yeah. Okay. It means that you uh, ignore the materiality for each element. Maybe one company is uh, weight more for one element, and the other company will weight more for the other elements like that, something like that, I mean. Yeah, yeah, actually I'm using both. I'm using a raw score for the main test and the equal weight score for the openness test. Okay, okay, thank you, yeah. yes. Okay, um, and Kasara, Kasara is our resident um, statistician. Thank you, Kasara, for all of your fantastic comments. Um, and I'm pretty sure we use the industry and firm fixed effects. Did you use that in your regression, Ricky? Uh, because this is one year study, so. Um, oh, it won't be, yeah, won't be, yeah. yeah. Industry? Yeah. Industry, um, not yet, not yet. But the sample size only 109, so. Um, there may be 12 industry. So, yeah. um, so yeah. let me think about yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So I think we're on time, um, Muhammad. And so Muhammad, can you just answer the question about the recording? Is there a recording available if anyone wants it or how does that work? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, video, the recording is available. I share it on my group in Facebook or and on my YouTube channel. If you allow to me. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is another question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Jacques Bert uh, and Ricky. Uh, thank you very much. It is an excellent presentation. Thank you very much for your contributions and your effort. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, so all that still means for me to say uh, is thank you everyone that joined us. Uh, and I thank you very much for taking the time out to present to uh, today, dear Professor uh, Jack Baird and Ricky. It's been really, really appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Mohammed. I just want to say I've put my email in the chat. Um, so if you want to contact me, you can contact Ricky through me. Um, so we're very happy to talk more and um, Ricky is very happy to present more aspects of his PhD in the next year. So thank you again. It's been fantastic feedback. It's uh, getting late here now. So um, uh, I'd like, it, it's really been great. And um, I look forward to seeing you again in this series. It's been great. So thanks all. Thanks to Mohammed for putting on an amazing um, session. So Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. And I hope to see you soon in Egypt, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
You are very yes, good. Yes. Yes. Very happy Thank to you. come and visit at some stage. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Ricky. You. Thanks, yeah, Ricky.